I'll now go ahead and swear in the witness. If you'll raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give in this manner would be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth that I'll be found? I do. Now, would you state your name for the record? My name is Earl D. Lovick. How long have you lived in Libby? Well, I've lived there now since 1948. What is vermiculite? It's a micaceous mineral, uh, which is uh, found near Libby, Montana, among other places. <laughs> the thing that causes it to expand or exfoliate is molecular water. And in pages in a book, which are made up of a lot of sheets, which is what vermiculite is, the water between those sheets forms to steam and it expands and it incre increases in size in only one direction. It was a basic strip mine operation. They had a mountain and they were skinning the outside of where the vermiculite ore body was. That vermiculite that they milled up there would be shipped down to this location where we're sitting today. And they would load out by rail the different vermiculites. It can be used for insulation in homes. Uh, it can be used as a soil conditioner. They've even attempted to uh, make food out of it. <laughs> At one time they were experimenting uh, with uh, making cookies. In fact, they made some right here in, in, in Libby. Was it about April 15, 1963, that uh, the Zonalite Company was merged into W.R. Grace? Yes, sir. Zonalite became a part of W.R. Grace by an exchange of stock. W.R. Grace really marketed the product heavily, and production really took off. Boy, those were the jobs. Have a job at the mine. You were someone in the community because you had steady employment. Uh, you could afford to give your kids things. You could afford to have a nice house. Those are some of the really permanent and good jobs. What do they call that? The social capital, I guess. Uh, talk about the impact of social capital in Libby. They were bright fellas, and bright men that ran the show up there. And as I was growing up, you knew who they were, and they were all always involved in their churches and other civic organizations around town. first experience there was, what in the hell did I get myself into? I just couldn't believe the, the dust and the, the dirt. I went into the construction room because that's where I was told to report. But first you go over to the uh, <clears throat> warehouse and get a respirator. I had this respirator on and in about 15 minutes I couldn't breathe. So I pulled this respirator off, and it was just plugged solid. I thought, boy, I'm not getting nothing done, and if I don't, I'm going to get canned. So I just pulled the respirator off and let it dangle around my neck here, and I, and I really went to work. And uh, Tom DeShazer was sitting in there, and he was the foreman of the construction department. And he said, how do you like that? Dust, and I said, "Jesus, that's the worst I ever seen. I, I can't imagine anything like it." And geez, they all laughed, you know, and slapped her leg, and said, "Ah, it's just a nuisance, dust. You'll get used to it." The stuff was in your clothes. It was everywhere. It was so fine. The only way you knew it is you'd pour out a cup of coffee. And you look down and you could see it settling in the top of your coffee. But you couldn't see it in the air, but you could see it settling in your coffee. You couldn't get it off of me, really. It just stuck, you know. And so I took it home with me. And I'd walk in the house, you know. The, my oldest daughter and my oldest son, they'd grab me by the legs, you know, because they was happy to see me and hear coming to Rita, you know. And, She'd come over, you know, and we'd have a hug, and Christ, I was covered with this stuff, you know. It, it wasn't that I was being sloppy, it was just that I couldn't get it off. Uh, is it correct from, that from 1948 on you knew, and the company always knew that there was a serious health problem because of the large amount of dust concentrated there? Well, it was certainly known that in some areas there were large 
concentrations of dust. And uh, it's certainly common knowledge that uh, too much dust of any kind uh, is, uh, is a, not a healthy situation. Grace was on the school board. Grace was on the hospital board. Grace on the bank. And when you talked about dust control here, uh, anything about the dust and, and what it was doing harmful to these people here, the first thing that came out of their mouth was, you, you're going to close that mine down and you're going to put all these people out of work? But you didn't have very many friends when you started talking like that. God the Father set his creation up as a mystery for all of us to try and solve. We all have a light side and a dark side within us. We can love, we can hate, we can live, we can promote life, or we can kill. Somewhere in the book of Revelation, it is written, the devil knows that his time is short. So if things get a little bit nuttier day by day, don't be too shocked or surprised by it. Each person has to make up their mind what's real to them. Hindsight is always so good, you know, uh, looking back. I'll just point to it here when I get over here a little bit. Uh, it's set right about out there. It was called the expansion plant. We had a furnace in there, and we'd run uh, raw ore through there, and we'd pop it is what we called it, but I worked in this building down here about two years. It was a good job. Even considering the dust, you know, <clears throat> I would have stayed there, but my wife wouldn't put up with it. She had to clean it up afterwards. About every year, they would x-ray you. If we ever got a report back, and it was very seldom we ever got a report back, uh, it was uh, no change. I started noticing that Dad wasn't feeling good. There was something the matter. He just wasn't the same peppy self. He really didn't understand what it was. He finally went to the doctor, and the doctor gave him the news that he had a heart condition. By 1966, he was relatively severe, having continual chest pains, and he was still managing to work at his job as operating the road grader. His logic was... The company's watching out for me. Margaret, I can still work. They're willing to let me work with a heart condition and to, to bring home a paycheck and support you. He got so he couldn't walk all the way to the store without stopping and leaning against a fence post. But he was still working. So it was 1971 when, when he finally went to the doctor and, and, and the doctor said that he shouldn't work anymore. He didn't feel that he should. My husband and I drove him down that day to Missoula to the doctor and he came out of the doctor's office and he was just stunned. And he said, the doctor said, there's nothing the matter with my heart. But he said, I have no lungs. So mom learned to drive and took up selling Avon products, I mean, door to door. In the meantime, dad sat there. He literally sat for 18 months and just died. Gail Benefield, of course, has been a friend of ours. In fact, when Rita and I got married, we lived right across the road from her folks. And I cough, you know, a little bit when I was talking to her, which I do pretty often. She said, well, that's that's the first thing, there. that's the first sign. She said, you better go over to Dr. Whitehouse and get tested. I can remember this pretty plain because I, he's looking at this paper and he said, uh, you're from Libby, huh? And I said, yeah. Well, he said, I don't know what you're here for. He said, just take your shirt off and step in this room here. So we went in and had an x-ray. And he said, well, you got asbestosis. And he said, you probably got about from five to ten years to live. So I, we went out and got in the car and started for home. And I suppose, I guess we got about halfway home, probably. 
And I said to Narita, I said, Jesus, you know what? She said, what? And I said, I just got a death sentence.